You turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Choir, thank you. I needed to hear that song this morning. They work hard and they do great. Amen, church. Man. Acts chapter 8. And while you're getting ready to turn there, let's uh, just take a pause and let's pray. Dearly Fathers, we come into this place this morning on this foggy, wet day. I pray that we would leave here knowing you were faithful. You're faithful when things aren't going our way. You're faithful when you are blessing us beyond what we deserve. Father, you are faithful. You are good all the time. Sometimes we lose sight of that, Father. Help us to walk in the truth, Father, that we would hide your word in our heart, that we would not sin against you by forgetting that you're faithful. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several years ago in Long Beach, California, there was a gentleman who went into a store to get lunch. A late lunch. It was late in the afternoon. He got a dinner for two and he was going to take him and the young lady he was with on a picnic date. He went in and placed his order and he picked up the bag and went out the door. But what he didn't know was the cashier had inadvertently given him the bag that they had put the bank deposit in. He gets to the picnic area and they're sitting down and they're talking and <clears throat> doing what young couples do, cooing and eyes gleaming and holding hands and they open the lunch bag and there's all this cash. And uh, he realizes what happened and he's an unusual man. He gets in the car and drives right back to the restaurant. He walks into the cashier. The manager is just fried and the manager's there and when they see him come in they all get excited. And uh, this is what transpired. He said, the manager was thrilled to death. And he says, oh, great. I can't tell you what this means. He said, well, I want you to know I came to get a couple of dinners and wound up with all this money. He said, you're the most honest man I've ever heard of. We need to call the newspaper and TV and get them to come out here. And the man said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. And he said, oh, no, we're going to do that. And the man said, come here. And he leaned in. He said, the girl I'm with is not my wife. And we don't need any press. And he walked out. Now, I'll tell you that to drive this point home. Everything isn't what it appears to be. He was honest about money, but he wasn't honest with his integrity to his marriage. And often we fall very easily for things because we want to believe it. Would you all agree? We will ignore evidences that are laid before us, advice that's given to us by others, often to our harm and our hurt, and often we hurt ourselves and others. And to be honest, at times we're not very discerning or street smart, and we take for granted what is told to us, or we take by faith what we see and hear, and yet the Bible over and over again says, test all things and hold fast to what is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Hebrews 5.14 talks about those who are able to handle the great truths of God's Word. It says, but solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use of their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Hebrews 5.14. And in a day and age when the number one verse that's quoted in our society is, judge not lest ye be judged, the Bible also says this, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with a righteous judgment. We're going to look this morning at a man who had been given the title, the great power of God. And we're going to find out he was the very opposite. He appeared to be something, but actually there was something missing. We're also going to look at when hardship comes, or when persecution comes, how God is faithful in that. So if you will look with me at Acts chapter 8. Starting at verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, talking about Stephen. and says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
They stayed in Jerusalem. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Now, this is a major turning point in the book of Acts. Right now, so far, the gospel has been in Jerusalem. And now what's going to happen is a persecution, a great persecution. Saul's heading it up. It's going to start to go north. It's going to start to go east. It starts to go south. The interesting thing is, this is exact, exactly what Jesus said. He said this, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's what they've been doing. And in Judea and Samaria. This is phase two. And it started with the persecution. Jesus said, this is, you're going to be my witnesses, and it's going to go out to the ends of the earth. And when it says Saul made havoc, that's an interesting Greek word. It mean, it descri- this is the word they use to describe a wild animal who's on the rampage seeking to destroy something with brutal force. This isn't he's just causing problems. He is out doing murderous threats, throwing men and women into prison. He is breaking up families. He is seeking to punish anybody who is going to follow this Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is doing something many of us do. He's got zeal without any knowledge. Who is he serving? He's not serving himself. He's serving God. He is doing this for God. Because the God he believes in is different than the God they believe in. And he is going to punish them because that's what God wants me to do. And that's what often happens with religious people. I didn't say Christians. I said religious people. Do you know that Christians often are known what they're against more than what they're for? Have you all noticed that? Because we get very zealous for things. We pick sides. We were talking to the men's group and one of our men said something that is very true, but I, you know, we need to be reminded of it, that Satan is all about division. And Saul is going to be driving a wedge with brutal force. And he's very sincere, but he's sincerely wrong. And he's actually fighting against God. Let me ask you this, just for thought. If people were to ask you, what are you for and what are you against, could they ask, answer more of what you're against or more what you're for? Let's keep reading. Wreaking havoc on the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. And all this has started because Stephen was martyred. Now, the word martyr is interesting as well. And I want this to drive home as well too. That's the Greek word martis. We get our word martyr from that. Four times in our Bible it's used of somebody who dies for their faith. The other 161 times it refers to somebody who is witnessing. So four times martis is translated someone who's died for their faith. The other 161 times it's about witnessing. Being a witness. Testifying as a witness. And what has happened is because Stephen has been killed for his faith, the Christians have fled. And that's following a biblical mandate given by Jesus. I believe it's in Matthew 10. Let me make sure. I'm going to look at my notes here. Matthew 10, 23. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Why? God wants you to live and be a witness. Now, does he call some of us to die as a witness? Yes. But sometimes what I have found out, and I found this out especially in a seminary class, it is easier to die for something than to actually live for something. We got this in a, in a uh, class we were talking about marriage. And the gentleman's name was Dr. Bennett. And I will never forget this. Dr. Bennett was a truth bearer. And he just let him fall. He wasn't mean, but you didn't want to do anything that wasn't true because he would correct you very quickly. And we were talking about marriage, and he said, men, how are, how are you supposed to live for your wife? She said, lay down, for your, lay down your life for your wife. And we had a man said, you know what? I'd take a bullet for my wife. You know, what he was saying is, everybody, I want you to know, just like Peter, I'll die for my wife. And this is what Dr. Bennett said. There's a lot of husbands that wish they could die. <laughs> it's easy to die. It is much harder to live. 
Don't take a bullet for your wife. Lay down your life and live for her. And we all kind of went, hmm. And we got very quiet. We let him talk to the rest of the class. It's sometimes easier to die for Christ than to live for him. Amen. And what we do is when somebody dies for Christ, we exalt them as the top example of what the ultimate sacrifice is. Don't get me wrong. God will even give them a crown, a martyr's crown, for those who died because they were asked to or called to. We're in our school. We're going through taking our kids through some missionary stuff in the Bible class, and we're taking them through the Gates of Splendor. How many know that book or that movie, Through the Gates of Splendor? Yeah, see, just one. I was kind of shocked. So when the kids said, I hadn't heard of that, I said, oh man, I've got to share this story with you. So we shared the story with them. How many have heard of Jim Elliott or Elizabeth Elliott? And more hands up. Okay. Um, Jim Elliott and four of his friends, it was a group effort. We're going to go do mission work to one of the most vicious tribes that studies have shown was probably the most violent tribe in the whole world. They were able to keep off the military, the police, and the oil company wanted to go in and do some work, but they were so violent, they were killing them, they were keeping everybody astray. They were going to go in and get these guys. And so the missionary said, let's go because they need the gospel. Now, if you want to see the movie that explains the whole thing, and it's great, it's called End of the Spear. It's a great movie you know, to explain everything that happened. Long story short, those men ended up making contact with them, building a bridge with them, and they had been communicating with them, and everything was going well until about 4.30. This was in 1957. 4.30, no radio contact. They didn't check in. They kept trying to call, couldn't get them. So, I believe it was the United States Army and the country's military went in to find out what happened, and they had all been killed. Every last one of them speared plane had been ravaged. They took all the canvas off the wings and everything. It was so bad at that time. You got to remember, America was a much stronger Christian nation at that time. It made the national news, the international news. They actually did a big, huge article in uh, Life magazine. I know some of you are going, what's Life magazine? Isn't that a serial? No. It used to be a, used to be a magazine. And then one of the guy's sisters and Jim Elliott's wife go into the tribe to witness them, to them. The sister ends up dying there, not because she was killed, but because of old age. She not only won that tribe, but they taught the tribe how to go and witness to the other tribes, and it became a great movement of God. But what you don't hear is what happened because of their death. We, we celebrate their death, and there's been books and movies made, but let me read you this. This is from his wife. This is from Elizabeth Elliot wrote this. To the world at large, this was a sad waste of five young lives. But God has His plan and purpose in all things. There were those whose lives were changed by what had happened on the beach that day. In Brazil, a group of Indians at the mission station deep in Mato Grosso, upon hearing the news, dropped to their knees and cried to God for forgiveness for their lack of concern for their fellow Indians who did not know Jesus Christ. From Rome, an American official wrote to one of the widows, I knew your husband. He was to me an ideal of what a Christian should be. He was stationed in England and with many uh, hours of jet flying immediately began making plans to join the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. A missionary in Africa wrote, Our work will never be the same. We knew two of the men and their lives have left their mark on ours. From the coast of Italy, an American naval officer was involved in an accident at sea, and as he floated alone in the raft, he remembered Jim Elliott's words that were printed in those articles. When it comes to time to die, make sure you have nothing left to do but to die. And he prayed that he might be saved knowing he had more to do than to die. God answered his prayer and he was rescued. In Des Moines, Iowa, an 18-year-old boy prayed for a week in his room and told, came out and told his parents, I'm turning my life completely over to the Lord. I want to try to take the place of one of those missionaries. Letters poured in from, to those five widows from Japan, Alaska, China, Texas, the Nile River, from around the world. And when an event like that happens, like a Stephen who dies, we instantly grieve, but God is working out something much greater. 
when those men were killed by ISIS, those Egyptian Christians, I don't know if you remember that, and they were all marched out in front of the camera and killed. Listen, we go, what a waste, what a tragedy, how dark, we're losing. No, we're not. When a persecution breaks out in church, throughout church history, what happens is it begins to what? If they're willing to live and die that way, then I'm going to be willing to live and die. And that's what's happening. We need to trust that God is working this out for a massive good and that He has a master plan. That's something we often are totally unaware of. And here He's working out a major outreach, fulfilling the word that Jesus Christ spoke to them before they even began. Look at verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. It has set it on fire. They're gone out. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. We've gone over the history of Samaria before, but let me just do a short one. The history of the Samaritans is they were a nasty, unclean race, and it started way back in the Old Testament. You cannot understand most of your New Testament if you don't understand your Old Testament. And so this is what happened. The Samaritans had a little civil war. It was a political issue. They didn't like this king, Rehoboam, so we're going to set up our own king, and they did what they wanted to do. And the ten tribes in the north said, we're going to follow Jeroboam, not Rehoboam. And so now you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The problem was the southern kingdom had the temple of God and the people from the north were coming down to worship. And they didn't like that. So they set up two golden calves and said, you can worship here. And they worshiped those. God tried to turn them back. They refused to repent. And they, Assyria came in and killed just about everyone, enslaved the rest. And those that were weak and uneducated and poor, they left there and made them crossbreed with other nations, which God forbid them to do. And that's what happened to them. So now the Sumerians are half-breeds. Now, fast forward. Israel's coming back from captivity. They're going into the promised land. Those that were in Samaria say, hey, we want to help. And they go, oh no. You're not allowed. You interbred. You're a half-breed. Sorry. So how did that make them feel, Pam? Pam? Real small and no hope, because you can't fix that problem. Then, on top of that, they wanted to come and worship, and they said, oh no, you're not allowed to worship. You're unclean and you're a half-breed. Don't you read the Bible? Don't you know what God says about you? And so they did what they did in the Old Testament, and they made their own temple on another mountain so they could worship God. Now, do you remember the story of the woman at the well? It says, our fathers worship on this mountain, and the Jews say in Jerusalem, in this place, where should, we, where should we worship? There's the problem. And this is what Jesus says. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For your father is seeking such to worship him. And what is happening today is that hour. When they went into Samaria, it began. And they're set free. Are they a half breed anymore? Now, listen to this. And this is what I want to drive home. And I'm not trying to step on toes, I'm trying to help us to see things and think a little deeper. Look at verse 9, and then we're going to go down a little bit further and come back to this point. Verse 9. Now when all these people are saved, God brings to our attention there's a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished people in Samaria. So this man in Samaria is God's man. How do you know that? Because it says, claiming that he was someone great. So he claimed himself to be great. He's doing these great signs. Verse 10. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest. All of them recognize this guy, and this is this title, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Now listen, 
they're listening to him because of what he can do. And how many people really are admired by this guy? Least to the greatest, everyone. They've given him this title, the great power of God. However, God doesn't call him a prophet. God doesn't call him his man. God doesn't say he's a Christian. God calls him a sorcerer. Now, in this world, there's three types of people that Christians usually clump everybody in as a, as a sorcerer or a cultic. There's what I call the sleight of hand, the magician, the illusionist. There's some Christians that have no part of that's magic and that's of the occult. You have nothing to do. But that's just trickery. You can teach a three-year-old to do those tricks. That's con. Then there's what I call the professionals. The professionals know how to manipulate people, make things work, and they appear very miraculous. Those are the ones you go to and they predict, I believe your father's name is this and this and you do this and this and you do that and you go, oh! And there's this really sad video, if y'all have Netflix, of a magician that does that in a Christian audience and fools them all. And they didn't know he was an atheist and doesn't even believe in God. And they go, great man of what? That's the professional. The third one we don't bump into too often, but they're there. They're from the kingdom of darkness. They've given themselves over to Satan. And the power of Satan can work through them. And it's real power. It's not fake. But it's of a darkness, and it usually leads to bondage and slavery. Matter of fact, in the end days, the Antichrist is going to fool the entire world with the signs and wonders. And it says, if it was even possible, the very elect of God also would be deceived. So those are the three things. Which one do you think this guy is? I don't know. But if he's got everybody fooled this way and he's doing great signs and wonders, I probably would lean to the third one because God calls him practicing sorcery. But he recognizes there's a difference between what Philip's doing and what he's doing. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. Verse 13, Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized he continued with Philip, and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, is that a genuine salvation? I don't think so because of what happens in the next couple of verses. But I want to preface that with this. I believe, as your pastor, and it doesn't say this in the text, and we can get in trouble when we do this, but I, this is what I believe, and I'll show you why in a second. I believe this was a surface belief. There's many people in church that have surface belief they're going to step into eternity with a rude awakening. What am I doing here? I think that's why it says when you look into hell, there's those that are weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be those crying and weeping for where they are and those that are angry at God for where they are. And I do believe, sadly, there's going to be some that are going to say, what am I doing here? Because it was surface belief. There's some that say, if you come forward, you're saved. I don't find that in my Bible, and I'm not against people coming forward. But if you're putting your faith in coming forward, your faith is not in who? Christ, but an act. There's some that say, well, I come to church, therefore I'm a Christian. I've been in church ever since I was. If you haven't given your life to Christ, you're not saved. Just because you're in church doesn't make you a Christian. Some of y'all are going, amen, pastor, I've seen some in here. <laughs> Listen, just because something happened or something doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. Listen, Judas Iscariot was able to do miracles for God and did ministry for God and work for God, and Jesus put him in trust of the money. Was he saved? No. Not everybody who says they're saved are saved. We see this in John chapter 2 because this is what it says when Jesus was there. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. 
and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Listen, he's doing all these signs. They believe in Jesus. There was times they believed him so much he said, we're going to make you king of Israel. These are the same people that later yell, crucify him, crucify him. There is a difference between a belief and a saving faith. He believed. He is not saved. Let's go on. I'll show you what I mean. He's putting his faith in an activity. Oh, well, I'll come back to that. I'm going to leave that here and keep going. Let's look at, look at verse 14. Now when the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent for Peter and John to them, who, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not fallen upon none of them. How many people had the Holy Spirit, here's the key word, fallen upon what does your Bible say? Right there in verse 16. None. But they, they were saved, weren't they? Hmm. Verse 17. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I know I'm jumping around, but this is all going to come together and make a point. Um, there are some that preach Jesus. They believe, both men and women, they were baptized. They were saved. Simon himself believed, was baptized. He wasn't saved. There's some that take this first, and you need to be careful of this. Take this first to show that you're not saved until the Holy Spirit comes upon you in a special way. They even teach this. They'll say, have you given your life to Christ? Yes. Have you received the fullness of the Spirit? No. Come here, let me lay hands on you and pray so you can receive it. And then they say, now you're genuinely saved. That is not what this says. And we have to be careful that we don't take one verse and use it to make up a whole teaching. I know I'm chasing a lot of rabbits this morning, but trust me, they're all going to go back in the same hole and you go, oh, that makes sense. Many cults and heresies and distorted doctrines are done by masters of one verse teaching. And some have taken this one verse and made a whole teaching out of it. So let me give you what I mean by that. You can take any verse in your Bible, make it say whatever you want. You can even use one verse, take it out of context, stretch it, inflate it, and make your whole focus of all your doctrines about that one verse. And you can even use God's Word to endorse sin. One verse. You said, no, you can't. Let me show you. Let's say this was a beer, and I'm drunk at a party. You'll never see me have either one of that happening, but let's say. And I'm drinking it, and you come, Pastor, you're drunk. Drunkenness is a sin. I go... Don't you know what the Bible says? Doesn't it say from Ecclesiastes, drink your wine with joy? <laughs> now, is that what the Bible teaches? No. If somebody, uh, God forbid, took my wife's life and I go murder them, and y'all come minister to me in jail... And say, why didn't you, why'd you do that? God told me to. It's right out of the God's Word. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's what the Bible teaches. Isn't it? That's what the Bible says, isn't it, Carolyn? It's in there. I did it. I was obedient to God. That's called one verse theology. Now I'm making it some extremes and y'all are kind of laughing. You can do it with adultery too. No, you can't. Yeah, it's better that two lay down together. Keeps you warm. You can take any verse and twist it. Amen or oh me. Listen, when you take one verse, build a whole doctrine on it, it's dangerous. What is happening here is two things are going on. Here's the first one God and the gospel is about reconciliation and forgiveness and the restoration of relationships. And Samaria has been treated like a dog by who? The Jews. The apostles are in Jerusalem. The gospel's gone out. The ones that validate the gospel is the apostles. And you want to hear something funny? God's got a sense of humor, Patricia. You're going to like this. He sends Peter and John. Now, if you know your Bible, that's hilarious. You know why? Because John was the one that said this about them. Lord... They would not accept you. Shall we call fire down from heaven and destroy them? And now God's sending him to go testify that they're part of the kingdom of God. They get there and they see that they're saved. 
there's other verses in the book of Acts where they're baptized, they're full of the Spirit, and they say, I'm sorry, they've been saved, they're full of the Spirit, and they say they have the Holy Spirit. Why are y'all waiting to baptize them? Baptize them. You can't take this one verse and make it to be something it's not. This is what this verse is talking about. It's the reconciliation of this tremendous hurt. The Jews come and say they are saved. And they lay hands on them. And this is the second thing you need to know about this verse. That verse is about a pun. Jesus said when you get saved the Holy Spirit will come in you. Before you're saved the Holy Spirit is working on you. But there are parts where the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that term is a reference for enabling power to become a witness. A martis. They're not only saved, the apostles come and lay hands and now they're empowered for a special ministry. And it's about reconciliation. Does that make sense? Listen. Verse 18. When Simon saw that through the laying of hands of the apostles the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, here's how I know he's not right. Give me this power. Give me this power also that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You neither have part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound in iniquity. And then Simon answered and say, pray, the Lord for, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. When Peter said, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money, we go, wow, Simon's pretty rough. But so are we. There's a story of a murderer who killed a man's wife and two children. And he was caught and sentenced to jail. And he got out decades later on probation and he sought that man out. And what he was hoping to do was to receive some forgiveness. And so he came to the man and he said, look, um, I know what I did is horrible and I can never replace it, but I've got all this money that was left to me and I'm going to give it to you to make things better. And because of that, I hope you can forgive me. And the man said, no. but it's everything I have. I don't care. Well, what can I do to make it right? You can do nothing to make it right. Just tell me and I'll do it. And this is where he said, I'll tell you what you do. You tell me exactly what you did wrong. Yeah, but you don't understand. I was on drugs then. That's the problem. You won't take any responsibility for what you did. In court, you blamed your family, you blamed your upbringing, and even here before me today, you're blaming it on the drugs. You made a choice and you took my family. All I'm asking you is to own it and admit it. He said, well, I can't do that. I disagree with you. He said, and therefore you won't get forgiveness. Does that sound harsh? I don't think it's harsh at all. All the Father's asking for is to own it. And the man doesn't want to, he wants to pay it. There's times I've sat in homes with people, they're buried out here now. And I share the gospel with them and this is what they say. Well, I'm going to clean my life up first and then I'll give my life to Christ. You know what they're saying? I'll pay for the gift of God. I'll earn it. 
I got to clean myself up first to be presentable. And when I feel I'm good enough, then I'll come to God. He's doing the same thing Simon did. The way that we receive the salvation of God and the gift of God is to own your sin and confess it and ask for forgiveness. And guess what your heavenly Father will do? And how much does he forgive you, Carolyn? Part of it? All of it. This is one of the saddest chapters in the book of Acts to me. Because this half-breed who's been disowned has been reconciled with their Jewish brothers and sisters. How do I know that? Because when they go back to Jerusalem where the Jews are, they don't go to the Jews. They go to the Samaritan villages and go there. And a great healing has occurred. And here's a man who wants the gift, but he can't own who he is. Are we that way? You know why you have marital problems? It's your spouse. Really? It might be. I have a problem with my employer and I need to find. It could be that we all, and I think we all do, have a problem owning our sin. Amen. And if you're here today. And you've never received the gift of God. You've never given your life to Christ. Do you know what he asked you to do? To con- not just own your sin, but to confess your sin. And he's faithful and just to what? Forgive your sin. Going to heaven and being saved is a gift that can't be bought. It can't be earned. It can't be worked for. But it's very hard because what you do have to do to say, I am a sinner and I've sinned against a God who loves me and who's holy and I killed his son because of what I did. Yeah, but Pat, he doesn't want the buts. He wants us to own it and confess it. Can we bow our heads today? Father, I pray that if there is someone here who hasn't given their life, they may be a surface believer. They've grown up in church, but they're living like the rest of the world. There's no difference between them and the rest of the world. They don't know you. You would not entrust those who believed in you in the sense that you would not give your whole heart back to them, reciprocated Jesus, because they had not given their whole heart to you. But for those who believe in you and confess, you give them the right to become children of God. And you not only give them your all, but you even prepare a place for those who love you. If you're here today and you've never done that, I pray that you would take some time right now to own it and confess it to him. And Christian, if you're here and there's sin in your life, and we all have it, for the Bible says no man in this room is without sin, would you spend some time confessing that as well? We're just going to take a moment and just pray to our Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you that you not only hear our prayers, you answer them. And we do thank you for Jesus Christ, who's all man and all God, who stood in the gap for us and paid the price for our sins. Father, if there's someone here today who's cried out to you, I pray that you would draw them to yourself with power and that your Holy Spirit would come upon them as it did the Samaritans, that you would equip them for ministry. And Father, as Christians, I pray that we would seek that, not the gift, but the giver as a gift, that we would be bold and courageous to witness, to share, to pray, to read your word. Father, if someone has given their life to Christ today, I pray that they would come and let me know before we leave. 
And as we sing this prayer of commitment, I pray that we would examine ourselves to see if we are of the faith, that we would not step into eternity and find out too late. Father, save us in Jesus' name and all God's people said.